Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome uh, to this panel about trade in uh, trouble, very topical theme. And what I'm going to do is just uh, keep a very conversational uh, discussion going, freewheeling. I've usually found that it's the best kind of format. And then uh, towards uh, the center point of our discussion, I will try and bring in you, the audience, to make it more dynamic uh, debate and a discussion and just uh, see where it uh, leads us. Let me just start by uh, saying it's uh, very hard to top what uh, President Jokowi said earlier on today with his references to the Avengers and uh, Infinity War and uh, the Thanos inside all of us. And I'm wondering if I could start there and talk about this rather adversarial climate in the global trading system and ask our panelists how bad is this situation going to be? Is it trade war as an infinity war or will cooler heads prevail? And let's start with Alan, because Alan, you're very good in terms of analyzing the uh, global trading uh, architecture. Are we on the verge of descending into an all-out, tit-for-tat, retaliatory trade conflict? Well, uh, it's actually quite difficult to answer that because this set of events is marked by a lot of uncertainty, a lot of talk, retreat, um, repeat, uh, and some of it is threats, and some of it is real, and some of it is not. But initially, of course, we said, well, a lot of trade friction, US administration, new policies, arguing with the EU, uh, renegotiating NAFTA. But of course, what I think in this part of the world we see now is something which is looking worryingly bilateral, and that is US and China. And if there's um, $60 billion of trade into US with 25% tariff and vice versa, and a threat of $200 billion of trade under tariff and of that sort, um, that's, I, I don't know where trade friction becomes trade war, but it, it doesn't look very good at all. We can move back from some of that, uh, but um, that's the way it's looking at the moment. And I hope we'll be able to talk about some of the ongoing effects, because it's not just US and China. There's some very big currents right around this region coming from that. Thanks for that, Alan. And uh, Daryl, if I can bring you, you in, uh, because Malaysia is quite an open, quite a trade-dependent, cyclical economy. Given the backdrop here, given the very challenging backdrop when it comes to trade, is this breathing fresh impetus into alternative trade deals like RCEP? Thank you, Sri. The, what, what is happening right now seems to give us this opportunity to look at ourselves once more in ASEAN. I know, uh, before I start on an Asian, I, I did hear some comments from friends during our conversation over lunch, that it's not as easy as I'm suggesting it to be, that ASEAN should start thinking about consolidating together once more, uh, talking less of being Thanos, you know, taking away the Thanos in us, uh, because at the end, Thanos did die, you know, by the way. So, <laughs> uh, we need to take away that greed about our own selves. And we need to start taking opportunity of what was already built uh, several years ago, and that is ASEAN. We have plus six. We have the, the other nations that, that are working with ASEAN as well. So we can create an economy through ASEAN where we can cushion all the effects of this uncertain American and uh, uh, Chinese trade war. And how do we begin? Where do we start? I would, I would propose that uh, during the ASEAN meeting, uh, the leaders of ASEAN, the economic ministers as well as the head of states, should just say, okay, enough of all the talk about our own country or the deficit of our country where some country says, oh, we are least developed than you or we are more developed than you. Uh, forget about that in ASEAN. Work as a singular ASEAN as an economy. Work as a singular ASEAN to trade between ourselves and make it seamless between ourselves. So. That, that could, and not 100%, but that could probably reduce the impact that is forthcoming because of this uh, tariff war. That being said, uh, Daryl, the, the regional diversity 
that makes up the RCEP membership, or I should say the potential RCEP membership, yes. could potentially be something of a stumbling block because a lot of these countries are at very, very different stages of their economic development. How, how will the negotiators square that circle? The negotiators should have in their mind the idea during RCEP discussion that the intention is to prosper their neighbour. If all our neighbours prosper together, whereby we help each other, whereby we, we input to each other on how to develop their country into similar, equal status as the others, then uh, we'll be all right. We'll, be, we'll do all right. The, the, you see, see Sri, a lot of people are already speculating on what is to come. We know it's going to happen, but then again, uh, we have to embrace the fact that the solution must come right now for us, at least in anticipation thereof. Tanabe-san, if I can bring you in, and I'm wondering if history is a guide here. In the 80s and the 90s, there was a lot of friction between your country, between Japan and the United States, and there was a rather bruising confrontation between Japan and, and the US. And now, look at where you are today. Politically, the alliances are quite strong. Economically, they are quite strong as well. Is history a guide here? And what can we take away in terms of the lessons that we learned from the US-Japanese trade friction and what we are seeing today? Yes. Uh I, I'm currently working for a private company, but uh, I have been long involved in uh, trade negotiation and trade policy making at the government. And in fact, I was involved in uh, uh, very severe US-Japan trade friction time. So, you know, what's happening now between US and China is a kind of uh, deja vu to me. <laughs> so. Uh, uh, there are uh, certain uh, solutions. Uh, back in 1970s, 1980s, we often pressured by the US with the uh, Super 301, so kind of a gunboat operation. And uh, we negotiated on many issues, almost all sectors. And we ended up, uh, in most cases, uh, sometimes uh, voluntary export restraint, or sometimes voluntary import expansion program by private sectors. So that kind of things, uh, that time, say uh, 30 years ago, uh, have worked uh, to soothe the, uh, uh, calm the situation. But thereafter, everybody learned uh, and we were in the Uruguay round negotiation and created WTO system. This is a open and free uh, trading system based on rules. So we have to be reminded what we have done uh, out of our experiences in uh, 80s. So rule-based open uh, multilateral trading system uh, based on rules, important. And we have to tackle with the, uh, the uh, unilateralism uh, coming uh, from certain corner. At the same time, at the same time, there are certain frustrations and complaints uh, by the United States, uh, which cannot be solved. Uh, the current WTO rules and systems uh, in that uh, perspective, uh, we have to uh, endeavor uh, to improve, reform the WTO systems. So we have to be in total mindset based on our historical experiences. Thank you for that, uh, Tanabe-san. And, and Victor, let me turn to you because you are best placed to offer the perspective from Hong Kong and also from mainland China, just let's start with Hong Kong first, just how concerned are the corporates with this very difficult trading climate and what is the mood in mainland China amongst the export industries and amongst the Chinese leadership as well in Beijing? 
I think we are a little bit confused, of course, because there's no clarity as to whether this is a short-term, medium-term, or long-term struggle. But I think um, smart businesses, which many of my Hong Kong friends are, we need to uh, hope for the best but prepare for the worst. And I, I think the psychology of the uncertainty really is the killer. Um, a lot of the investment decisions are likely to be uh, slightly slower down. And uh, Hong Kong being uh, one of the premier you know, merchandising center and a bridge in and out of China, obviously, if this trade war is going to be more than a, a short-term phenomenon, uh, there will be serious uh, repercussions. And Hong Kong itself also has some structural problems that we need to uh, uh, manage. You know, our, our, our peg to the US dollar on a fixed rate is producing uh, uh, daily challenges. Our stock market has dropped 20%. Um, that really is a accelerated technical uh, correction because the Hong Kong asset prices um, have been uh, grossly uh, overblown in the, in the last five years. Right? So in a way, if you look at the silver lining, it is an opportunity for us to get back to basis, catch up, look at our um, competitive advantages, and try to be more lean and mean and reform. And one of the initiatives, for example, for Hong Kong was the Hong Kong ASEAN Free Trade Agreement that we signed last November, which is very interesting. Uh, Hong Kong wants to be more than just a Greater China Bridge. We want to be at the center of Asia, uh, looking at a closer relationship with Japan, with uh, ASEAN, um, and whilst contributing to the China's Rule and Bridge uh, initiative and the Great Bay Initiative. There's a lot of initiative coming out of Hong Kong right now. And uh, uh, in the last 10 years, we have invested over 100 billion US in infrastructure and all coming on stream. Now on China, I think the, the net impact of the trade war is yet to be felt because so far is uh, de minimis. But it's the psychology of that trade war leading to a major strategic competition between two of the greatest economic powers in the world. That is uh, uh, nasty. And uh, I've always taken the view that uh, uh, President Trump is a smart businessman, and President Xi is a very reasonable man, and they seem to get on. And between them, they must be able to find a solution that can um, you know, satisfy the immediate needs of uh, each domestic uh, political uh, constituency. Now, the silver lining of this trade war is that China's macroeconomic domestic reform is able to break some barriers, you know, like the improvement of intellectual property rights, uh, better market access for international investors, and also the improvement of the rule of law generally. That is going to be a silver lining because of the pressure from, uh, from the West. But then the psychology of a strategic rivalry is something which may get the domestic um, sentiments uh, misled in both countries. And I think that is something that we need to work at. Do you feel, Victor, that if things get really messy in terms of retaliation, China will make it difficult for companies to operate? in the mainland? I hope not, because China, uh, like my learned friend from Japan has said, um, is committed to a rule-based uh, trading system. Uh, China has, uh, at least on its external um, uh, economic affairs, wants to remain open and actually more wide open and uh, pivot itself to its uh, Asian neighbors. You know, the fact that we have a vice premier uh, of China here in, uh, in Honai is, uh, is very special. Um, and I think that sends a message that uh, China wants to work much closer uh, with its Asian neighbors, including ASEAN, but also Japan, India, and Korea. So we all hope that cooler heads will prevail in this trade dispute, but if it does go down the slippery path of retaliatory tit-for-tat action, then what options does China have? Because the sense that I'm getting is that they are running out of tats, so to speak. And that leaves 
the currency. Is there a risk that Beijing will, as some believe it may, weaponize the currency and depreciate it to support the export sector? You know, in the era of global supply chain, the impact is going to be unthinkable if we have a major uh, long-term struggle, more than a temporary uh, trade war. It is the consumers in the market, in the US and worldwide, which is going to take the hit immediately. Because basic commodity consumer products is going to be a lot more expensive. And in China's tit for tat, is going to be a lot more measured and specific. And that's going to hit constituencies, which shouldn't be, right? And then in, in this part of the world too, because a lot of the manufacturers here produce intermediate products for final assembly uh, in China, um, is going to be too. So the, the, the thinking that trade war between US and China will benefit Asian manufacturers, that may happen you know, uh, in the medium long term, but short term it's actually quite difficult to replace China's supply chain. Probably, I think my Japanese friends will be the, probably the most efficient in reinventing that because they have been big investors in China and also big investors in ASEAN. A Japanese investor is the biggest uh, investor in, in ASEAN. They will be able to, probably to manage the supply chain arrangement, but not everybody can be that efficient and that quick. Um, so I think it is not something that uh, uh, I, I like to think uh, should happen in the long term. A very important point, Victor, that uh, I'd like the panel to uh, expand on, and that is the reaction amongst companies based in Asia who have supply chains, especially in China, who are now looking to uh, relocate because of the uh, trade frictions. And uh, let me start with uh, Tanabe-san. Is that a conversation that Japanese uh, multinational corporations are having right now? And if they are, uh, what are the favored destinations in terms of supply chain relocation? I would expect here in Vietnam would be one of them, and Thailand as well. If you could expand on that, that would be very useful. Well, uh, generally speaking, uh, major uh, multinational uh, Japanese companies have a strategy of uh, China plus one, meaning, of course, uh, a lot of investment has been done uh, in China, and maybe more investment. But uh, to balance uh, China, uh, many Japanese uh, big industries are investing mainly in, in ASEAN, sometimes uh, India, sometimes Bangladesh. So in that way, Japanese major uh, companies uh, have done certain uh, hedging operation already. But still, still, those uh, big companies uh, will have trouble in uh, certain uh, sudden shocks. So they have to be well prepared. And, but uh, th there are many uh, SMEs and uh, uh, mid-sized mid uh, companies uh, only investing in one place. One place. That's, uh, that's a, a bit uh, a difficult situation for them uh, to shift or transform their supply chains. So in any way, uh, uh, controlling and keeping, maintaining supply chains needs stable uh, trade and investment regime that should be reminded to countries like, of course, the US, China, and big countries. They should be mindful of a uh, global economy, uh, which will be affecting the uh, sudden change, affecting the supply chains of uh, big industries uh, and also SMEs. And Alan, if you could just uh, pick up on that point and this time put on your uh, former central bank governor's hat and talk about the second round effects of tariffs and especially this tariffs as taxes on the consumer narrative which seems to be gaining a little bit of traction in the US. We're already starting to see the pricing pressures at the factory gate in PPI and I think the crucial question for policymakers at the Fed is at what point 
are those producers going to pass on those higher costs to consumers? And at what point are we going to see a rather nasty cost push inflation uh, situation? Well, you do have to think about that. And um, all the economic models say this is a bad thing. It's going to hurt. It's going to hurt. The, the models say it's going to hurt the United States and China. Um, I've heard some people in ASEAN say, well, we can do something more positive out of it. Uh, but how does it hurt? Mainly through price increases, but also through distortion and pushing businesses into investing in second best places as a result of all of that. Uh, it doesn't happen short term. The negative effects take a while to feed through. Yes, you're right, there's been some evidence of industrial price increase in the United States. I can't see any sign of consumer price index yet, but of course it's going to happen if that continues. And that will be a very, uh, there will be a significant negative in all of this. So I think short term, you know, we're seeing um, businesses checking supply chains. We're seeing inventory going up because um, businesses are worried about shortfalls or... So they're front loading, in other words. I'm talking about the Asia Pacific right. region as a result of getting into markets in the United States. US economy looks like it's growing very well. Some of that is inventory build up some of which will be shorter term sort of feature. And then more medium term is the question about investment. Where do you invest and how do you move this? A lot of the exports out of China into the US are mainly not made in China. They're mainly made in other places, particularly mainly in ASEAN and a fair amount of it with Japanese or other foreign investment. And of course, that does mean that in the medium term it's mobile, but everybody's waiting to see just where all that comes through. Um, could we see uh, a real impact in, on exchange rates or from exchange rates? I mean, ironically, in China at the moment, with the RMB weaker than it has been against the US dollar, it looks like they're probably getting a lift to their exports roughly of the equivalent of the negative effect that the tariffs from the US have put in place. Uh, but again, that could be a short-term sort of feature. We wouldn't want to see a big impact coming through onto exchange rates out of this because at that stage you start saying, could an economic shock like this have a financial implication as well? Uh, let me just pick up on that with specific regard to China. And in the course of uh, our reporting, a lot of currency strategists have been saying that, look, uh, dollar CNY at the seven level is a very politically loaded number. And that's a red rag to, the, to a bull in the Trump administration. Are we going to get there? And if we do get there, uh, is there a risk that the US will use that as ammunition to label China as a currency manipulator and up the ante even further? Well, we don't know. I mean, it could happen. Uh, it won't just happen with China. If you look around the region, you'll see plenty of other exchange rates that have dropped by around 9% this year. And of course, that's partly because the US dollar, or largely because the US dollar has increased as a reserve currency. So I, th I think we all understand the whole thing is connected like that. I don't know what the political rhetoric will be on the back of that. But suffice to say, as trade tensions uh, escalate, this is going to be a pro-dollar story because it's going to feed into, paradoxically, uh, safe haven demand for the US dollar. Yeah. That's, that's right. a fair assumption, is it? OK, uh, if anyone has any questions in our audience, uh, I'd love to bring you in at this uh, point in time. If you could just uh, say who you are and where you're from, we'll get a microphone uh, to you. Does anyone want to get the ball rolling? We have a colleague with a microphone who's in the audience. Yes, sir. That's Donald. Hi, I'm Don Hanna from CIMB. We've been talking about trade, but some of the conflicts that we see in particular vis-a-vis -vis the United States and China revolve not so much about trade as they revolve around investment and the rules that govern investment and intellectual property rights. I wonder what opinions that panel might have on, on those issues. Thank you. Who'd like to tackle that one first? Because it is a very important question insofar as there is a perception that there are uh, IP issues going on in China, but the tariff narrative 
the heavy-handed approach seen by some is not the right way to go about it. Victor, do you want to tackle that one? Yeah. I think the psychological effect of uh, the trade war, which may lead to something more fundamental, will basically force investors to, to, to wait and see. Um, it, we, we are upon the verbs, right? And we, we, we are... Um, I, I think it's only responsible uh, as an investor just to wait and see a little bit to see how events unfold. And one hope is a short-term thing, but if it's a long-term thing, we have to review our, our investment uh, 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 you know, plans and, uh, and to see whether um, uh, we can do it smarter. But that's the sad thing, because we've, we're taking out liquidity, long-term FDI, which were otherwise coming into emerging markets to, to fuel the, the, the reform and development. And I think this trade war is going to make investors second guess um, the end result. It likewise with Brexit, you know, um, a, a lot of us have been looking to invest in, in the United Kingdom. But uh, Brexit is like a mirror image. You don't know how it will unfold. So the, the natural thing is to wait and see. So I think that is part of the problem. We're going to see less liquidity flowing into uh, ASEAN. We're going to see less FDI uh, uh, coming in if this trade tension persists. And I hope um, we're all mindful to that and really talk to our, our own um, representatives in the, in, in, in the right countries to, to find a way around so that it doesn't affect not just the global supply chain, but the normal investment flow. Um, Alan, we will get to you, but just a cheeky question from me, Victor, because I am British, in case you didn't realise, but on uh, Brexit, is there a risk that we see Britain crashing out of the European Union by that deadline of March 2019 with no transitional deal? Well... Who knows? That's the, I think that's the... If you ask number 10, um, they will say that uh, uh, that won't happen, right? But then if you ask uh, the man on the street, uh, every day there are more people thinking that it could be... Uh, the no-deal scenario is becoming more real. And that will probably be the worst-case scenario for everybody. And I, 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 myself, I hope that that will not happen either. Thank you for that, Victor. Alan, you wanted to uh, make a point. Yeah, very interesting question on intellectual property and investment. And I think the political economy looks totally different about that because in the United States, there's quite a bit of concern about tariffs, but there does seem to be a community of interest right across the corporate sector that there is something about the difficulties of investing in China and the worries about preserving intellectual property and all of that. And indeed, it looks like there could be a coalition of interest, not just American, but European and others as well. And some of that is behind some of the concerns around the WTO dispute systems as well. So that's a little bit different from a political point of view. But of course, we know uh, that when it comes to investment regimes, <coughs> it's, it's quite less transparent um, in terms of barriers to these things. And also, there's quite a lot of room for retaliation just from a country making it more difficult for another country to invest uh, through bureaucratic red tape, you know, those sort of issues. Uh, of course, that comes back to the Made in China issue. And uh, Made in China, which is getting a lot of attention in the United States, a lot of criticism there, looks a little bit like what Japan did in the 1950s, 60s, and uh, the Asian Tigers did in the 60s, 70s, 80s, except that China is so big that, that really moves the world and thus does make it more difficult like that. But again, I wonder if what we might be seeing in terms of um, uh, criticism from the United States on that could actually feed into that China made in China um, argument because more and more we see um, ZTE, for an example, uh, which has got a lot of trouble supplying its own semiconductors out of China and one of the arguments that presumably China takes out of that is we need to be more self-sufficient and we'll see where that one runs. And is this really at the core of this uh, trade dispute? It's Washington's beef with 
made in China 2025. Oh, that's one of the beefs. And how insurmountable then are these non-tariff barriers on both sides? Well, I'm not sure we've really seen the non-tariff barriers yet, but there's a lot of scope for them to come and to come in covert ways that could be very difficult to deal with. Darrell. Actually, the same opinion, actually. You can't really tell on the non-tariff uh, problems that we will face when, when the time comes. Um, I'm looking more at ASEAN again, you know. Uh, like, I'd like to quote what Jokowi mentioned. The Avengers all got together. So this is that moment in time where we have to start thinking about what will impact on us in the coming uh, year. Because all this, like Alan mentioned, uh, and also Victor mentioned, as well as uh, uh, Tanabe, you won't feel it now. You'll probably feel it next year. The impact will be there. Property prices will be impacted as well. Uh, and, and, and so will uh, cost of goods, uh, services as well. So ASEAN have to get together. And all those that are able to work together, uh, including the other non-ASEAN country within our region, um, should sit down and say, okay, we better create this economy amongst ourselves and buy between ourselves as well. Uh, and it's interesting because we were talking about this in the green room. The ASEAN-China yep. factor is a very compelling one. Yep. Victor has said it very clearly. Yeah, the dragon and the tigers. Exactly, but there are some. <laughs> there are, there yeah. are some issues. There and your country be, has been be uh, has been faced with those issues. Yeah, there will be issues. I wonder if we can return to that uh, conversation. Just get back to the yeah. audience. And yes, gentleman in the second row has a question. Yes, sir, please. Hello, I am Praveen uh, from Avada Group India. I had a question, I mean, in the last two decades, most of the countries have thrived and grown uh, through this global trade. Now with uh, protectionism, is, I know at its peak, uh, US had spat with a lot of countries, even uh, countries within themselves are, uh, you know, blocking uh, trade and creating trade barriers. How do you foresee, you know, global trade going forward? And what's like the policy pres prescription for government, governments uh, for uh, achieving this in case, uh, uh, the trade barriers increase further down. Did you make out the question clearly? I, I, I'm so sorry, sir. There was some problem with the uh, audio or maybe the microphone. Microphone. Sorry. Could you just uh, repeat is, your question? Uh, see, because of uh, the trade barriers that that's increasing, now most of the uh, uh, countries had policies around export or export-oriented growth, right? Uh, China is a prime example of that and a lot of companies have a lot of countries have tried to replicate it but now with this global trade uh, you know with a lot of these trade barriers and inward looking approach of countries uh, what's the approach that developing countries should take you know to uh, for in terms of uh, to achieve growth uh, if there are trade barriers are too high trade barriers are too high okay so i i think the gist of the question is, uh, for countries that are quite heavily dependent on trade, and if the situation with trade is looking increasingly uh, challenging, then is it incumbent on those countries to start um, building out a more stronger domestic consumption-led uh, economy, which is what China is doing now, admittedly. Is that the hedge and is that, is that the offset? Yes, I think that's an interesting question, but quite a complicated one. Yeah. Um, actually, when I look at the regional trade flows, I'd say that initially uh, some of the problems or, or challenges aren't so much ASEAN, they're actually Northeast Asia, because it's Korea and Japan and Chinese Taipei that are exporting into China with some minimal value add which is going on to the United States. So they look like the ones that have got the highest exposure via China into the United States. And so it will be interesting to see if there is um, rehubbing or investment that doesn't just come to ASEAN, but might go into other Northeast Asian places for that. Um, and then that also brings up another issue. Would we see other countries in the region uh, retaliating uh, or doing 
domestic policy moves they might want to do, which mightn't look like they're WTO compatible, but doing it undercover effectively. And we've already seen one country putting up tariffs recently, and um, it's hard to criticise that when... Uh, and you're referring to Indonesia? Yes. Right. And, and let's pick up on that, because you and I were talking about this, Alan. And Indonesia's tariffs on, I believe it's in the region of 1,500 consumer goods is aimed at reducing import dependency and therefore stabilizing the currency. That seems to be born out of necessity. Are they going to get hit by the WTO and are they, are, are, are they protectionist? Well, some of it uh, I understand they are doing because um, of exchange rate movements uh, rather than just um, sort of industry policy. But yeah, uh, they could, and it could spread through ASEAN, and that wouldn't be good for ASEAN as a whole. Thank you very much indeed for that uh, question. Does anybody else want to uh, contribute? Gentlemen towards the front, please. My name is Munir Majid. I'm from ASEAN Business Advisory Council, Malaysia. I think you mentioned the 80s and the 90s, and the standout uh, event then was the Plaza Accord, so-called Plaza Accord, which resulted in the revaluation of the yen and, and the Deutsche Mark at that time. And this, in turn, resulted in a relocation uh, of investment, especially by the Japanese companies. Now, have we reached a point in this trade war where people are beginning to take investment actions to displace, you know, to, re to get out of China, or even Chinese companies, also investing outside of China uh, so as to surmount the barriers that's coming uh, from the states and take advantage of the ASEAN integration that the minister uh, spoke about. Uh, Tadabisan, say, please, go I, ahead. I would say, uh, yeah, we have experienced uh, uh, trade frictions, then uh, Plaza Accord, then uh, uh, the uh, exchange rate uh, you know, rearrangement uh, very sharply, very sharply. That was a shock. So Japanese industries making a uh, uh, lot of investment uh, in Asia, especially in ASEAN countries. But uh, at this moment, I don't think there is that kind of uh, shock, that magnitude of uh, shock uh, has not yet uh, happened, uh, especially in, in terms of the exchange rate issues. I don't know uh, certain political uncertainty uh, which may affect investment decision by uh, companies of uh, those countries. I don't know yet. And I know, I'm glad you mentioned the Plaza Accord, and I know it may be a little bit of a pie-in-the-sky theory, but in some circles there is now talk of a Trump Plaza Accord, where the currency, the US dollar, is revalued. Uh, Trump has already made it no secret that he wants a weaker dollar. Uh, there seems to be confusion over the exact direction of dollar policy, but... Um, Let's bring in the uh, former central banker on that. Yeah. What, what's, the, what's the possibility of that happening? Weaker dollar. Well, I don't think there's much chance of a weaker dollar while the US is reserve currency and while there's volatility in the markets and concern about future policy. In addition, no one's mentioned US macro policies where we have this rather unusual situation of a, a gradually tightening monetary policy but a very loose fiscal policy that's going to need a realignment at some stage as well. So I don't know, but I don't actually see how that one happens. And Alan, do, do you think this US growth leadership that we're witnessing now, this, this entire narrative over US exceptionalism, as far as the growth trajectory is concerned, is that part of the explanation as to why we are seeing such an aggressive trade posture that Washington feels, look, we are winning this, we're doing okay, the markets are doing well, why stop here? Well, I mean, there is strong activity in the US economy, and you can see current and previous presidents arguing about who's responsible for that, uh, but that's been a long time building up in all of this. Um, there's 
there's quite limited capacity now. Uh, with the steel issue, for example, I understand a number of old steel plants are being taken out of mothballs and put back into production, but there'll be lower productivity. Uh, you'd have to expect there's going to be price pressures on all of that. So uh, this has got to come through in the wash. It's going to take some time to do that. And then we still don't know how much of what's being talked about in a policy sense is actually going to be ongoing and long term. And we'd very much like to see what happens in NAFTA as well. OK, thank you for that, Alan. And uh, let's return back to the audience. Uh, does anyone else please say uh, right in the front row? Thank you very much. My name is Kumagai, and uh, I'm a chief economist of Daiwa. And uh, I'd like to ask a simple question. Uh, what are the best scenario and the worst scenario of the current uh, global trade war? And what is the uh, most important uh, point of divergence between these two scenarios? Very good question. Daryl, shall we start with you? Best and worst case scenarios uh, economically. Let's start with, uh, with your country, which is pretty trade dependent. Yeah, we, have, we, have, we will be definitely very concerned on what will happen because we are very dependent on trade and we do export a lot to both China and also to uh, America. They are our biggest trading partner as well. So if there was any diversion of it, like I said, we know this is going to happen. We know, we know what's to come. We best focus on what we already have within our region first. Uh, the supply chain uh, is amongst all of us anyway, uh, between ASEAN uh, and also you know, uh, Indochina. We're all together. Uh, we just built our economy between ourselves first and, and still trade on with, with the Chinese and of course the Americans while they have their problems and issues. We hope that their leadership will come into uh, the table and we hope that they can discuss together and, and treat this as a matter that needs to be resolved sooner. Enough of all the tariff wars imposed between each other as well. And look at the bigger picture and the bigger picture is all of us, ultimately the future. That's my thought on it. Thank you, Daryl. And uh, let's just cross over right to the other end of the panel and uh, pick up uh, with uh, Victor. We're already seeing a slowdown in economic activity in mainland uh, China. There is a sense amongst some of the more uh, pessimistic forecasters that we could see growth decelerate by the end of the year to 6.2, even 6%. I know that's a worst case scenario, but how realistic is that? Let me start with the, the best scenario. Right. The best scenario with um, pressure from Washington will encourage China to speed up its structural economic reform, which has been blocked by a lot of vested interests. So in a way, uh, Xi Jinping and a lot of the reformist group will be helped by the White House. And indeed, this argument could apply across the world because we, uh, we treasure the rule-based system that we have uh, built up over the years. I mean, the WTO, by no means perfect, but it's the fairest and the most non-discriminatory uh, system we have, uh, detailed with other uh, international organizations, none of which are perfect. But, but even, even that is coming under question now. Exactly, but if because of the the way that Washington is coming out, it makes me, make us think and it creates a climate of reform. Now, if we just achieve that, President Trump will go down in history as the most effective American president in modern history. Now, I'm saying that's the best scenario. It's a catalyst for strategic, smart, reasonable reform. Because it may well be Trump's negotiation position, because he, he's never shown his, 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 his real card. Right? So, so in other words, he will go down in history if he manages, through his trade policy, to get the leadership in Beijing to correct the imbalances. And indeed, in terms of other, some of other international initiatives too. Right? Okay? But that's the best scenario. Okay. The worst scenario is that this 
trade war becomes a long-term struggle between ideologies. And everything we have learned to expect in the last 30, 40 years, that reform of a market will allow a society, whichever political system it may be under, to be more open, more responsible, more responsive to social needs, and also play a more constructive role regionally, internationally. All that probably will, will have to be re redefined. And trade problems will lead to economic problems. Economic problems tend to lead to political problems. Political problems will lead to social problems, and social problems will lead to conflicts. And that is not something which, uh, personally, I like to entertain at all. So I think we have to be, be careful that uh, it is, you know, 70, 80 years ago, after the, the, the major conflict, we set up international institutions, including the likes of International Chamber of Commerce, um, many tr to promote trade and development because we believe that is, the, that is the guarantor of harmony and peace. And it's only with peace that societies can prosper, right? So I think that is the, it will, could be a, a worst case scenario. Uh, and Victor, just very quickly, would you agree with President uh, Jokowi when he said that this current round of trade tensions is so intense and he hasn't seen this kind of intensity on the trade front since uh, going back in history in the 1930s? Is that an accurate representation historically? I I think this time is different, because this time when we have these tensions is coupled with major generational change, technological change, and societal change. I think that's where, you know, the combination of all happening at one time uh, makes the whole thing more unpredictable. And, uh, you know, the, because until a, 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 probably three years ago, we believe we are in a globally interdependent world, we are in a globally connected world, and we look upon the benefits of globalization that, will, that has brought millions, hundreds of millions uh, from the property line. We look at the benefits of that, and now we are seeing some of the pushbacks of globalization and the speed of technological change, and people feel uncertainty displaced. And now you're having this, whether it's right wing or left wing, um, radical uh, political uh, voices becoming mainstream. So I think it's, these tensions are happening at a time of major social change. And that's why it's difficult to deal with. Uh, well, I would say the best case scenario would be uh, China will offer a certain uh, concession to the US. Because uh, if they go into trade war, the China has more disadvantage because of the uh, difference of uh, uh, dependence on export. So China will be more affected. So China, uh, uh, smart people, China's uh, leadership are very smart and learn uh, a lot from the history, including Japanese experience. So I would hope uh, China will offer maybe certain important import uh, expansion program or a certain uh, reform on, uh, say, IPP or uh, uh, SOEs. So they, they can do, they should do. Uh, then uh, uh, U.S. Uh, may be satisfied. That's the best case scenario. The worst case scenario is, of course, the tariff war, trade war, going uh, e e to affect each other. And, uh, affecting the global economy. Uh, in order not uh, that happen, uh, we have to work hard. We mean Asia, East Asia especially, say Japan, ASEAN, or APEC. We should uh, work, including Hong Kong, of course. Uh, we should work. Uh, so we have to build up certain mechanism. We have now uh, CPTPP, uh, which should uh, enter into force as soon as possible, and maybe uh, expanding, uh, maybe expand uh, to have uh, new members. And RCEP, 
RCEP is very important, and now we are in the final stretch of the negotiation. We should uh, agree the high-level uh, RCEP uh, agreement uh, for, for the sake of uh, East Asia uh, and for the sake of a global trade uh, regime. So that kind of, uh, you know, tools we have to build up. Then during doing so, we should, and I think we can, build up mutual confidence among East Asian people, APEC people, and of course including China and the U.S. That kind of uh, mutual uh, trust building process uh, is very important. Alan. Yeah, well, that was an interesting question, I've, and I agree with all the answers. Uh, I mean, best possible uh, that we see some of the policies that have been put in place being pulled back, uh, that we see the current account deficit of the United States, that, well, actually, it's the merchandise trade deficit with a focus on the manufacturing sector, to be precise. We see that particular deficit against China, because that's the one that's the really big one, um, pulling back, but it's not happening at the moment. Uh, and we're going through a period when, after all, we are seeing a bipolar world move into a multipolar one, and that's been happening. Who would have thought that Japan would have taken leadership of the TPP? I would never have thought that would happen. It has happened. Is it possible that India could do the same thing on RCEP? Maybe. We need the next tier of um, economies and countries to step up and take leadership in all of that. Uh, worst, worst possible, well, yeah, it's the trade, it's a broad Japan, trade Japan war. is ready to lead. Well, Japan with, already With the did, support of uh, APEC, mm. East Asia, mm. all those people, in order to keep the uh, healthy global trading scheme. So you wouldn't have heard that a little while ago, so, so that's a positive. <laughs> Um, negative, that this really gets a trade war and it jumps from the economic sector into the financial sector and that we then have a financial crisis as well and having been in the central bank during a global financial crisis, I don't want to see that again and I bet if you were at Daiwa then you don't want to either and I don't think we will either. Alan, just very quickly by means of a follow-up, uh, the US-China trade deficit is really at the core of all of this. Am I right in saying that Washington will only really call off the dogs of war, the dogs of a trade war, only if that US-China trade def deficit starts to narrow appreciably, which could, take, which could take years? I think that's a political question, not an economic one. So the president clearly identified what he calls the current account deficit, what I'm calling the merchandise trade deficit. Actually, that, remember, that ignores services. The United States has a brilliant trade surplus. Silicon Valley, tourism, financial sector, that all goes into the services side, not the merchandise side. Uh, as far as Canada is concerned, the uh, United States has a trade surplus with Canada, not a deficit, because they've got such a big services surplus. If you, in addition, add on all the profits that come back from US foreign investment, for example, in China, and then go back to the United States, then that tr so-called trade deficit drops from 2% of GDP to 0.8% of GDP, far smaller. But if you just focus on that merchandise trade deficit, there's a problem because it's not actually reducing at the minute and um, currently this year it's been increasing. Uh, I, I thought that China was quite interested in doing a deal where that could be manipulated bilaterally, but it doesn't look like that's quite happened at the minute. We'll, we'll have to wait and see. Well, the, Ameri the, the Americans are face, I mean, the American president will face an election, whereas China won't. So that's the difference. So one has a longer staying power, the other is termly. <laughs> so they better solve it once and for all. Sit down, solve the problem, just get the two together. Which, has been, which, to has, been tried which has been tried before, but it's... But not, not between in, the two. Ended in brinkmanship and ended in failure. Um, again, again, like I said, one faces an election, the other one does not. And ultimately, this is increasingly a, a political narrative that's informing the trade policy narrative too. Right. Uh, I think we have time for one more. Yes, please, sir. And there's a lady over there as well. 
Thank you, Simon Lacey from uh, Huawei Technologies. Um, oh, hey, Ralph, nice to see you here. Um, listen, I just wanted to ask two, two things. Um, so Victor Chu said um, that there was this sort of conflict of ideology. And from, from what I can see, this isn't really about ideology. You know, I mean, the, the geopolitical interests of China and the US are broadly aligned. And, and even though, you know, you have guys like Marco Rubio uh, and others um, in the Senate who, who are constantly making reference to the, the Chinese Communist Party and, and, and et cetera, um, really, I think it's not about ideology, but so much uh, about um, uh, t the, the struggle for technological leadership. So, you know, America has, since, since the 1950s, since Sputnik, ha has always understood its military and geopolitical advantage in terms of its technological leadership. And I think now that China is starting to get close to assuming leadership across a whole range of technologies, such as you know, AI, big data analytics, um, advanced robotics, ICT, I think that, that has actually got the US um, a little bit uh, phased, and that's why we're seeing the struggle, and that's why things are going to get worse before they get better, because China is just going to continue on this road. The other thing I wanted to ask very briefly, is it possible that Trump really believes the rhetoric on the trade deficit? Because he's, he's had some you know, very um, knowledgeable economists, they must have told him that the trade deficit, I mean, economists agree the trade defi deficit isn't really a problem. If you want to reduce the trade deficit, you've got to raise domestic savings rates. And also, you know, the 600 billion uh, that, that goes um, from China to the US in terms, of, uh, in terms of exports, um, the value add on that, most of that accumulates to the US anyway. And these are things that somebody must have told Trump about. And I'm just wondering if you think he's, he's ignoring the, the reality of, of what you know, most economists would agree on. Thank you. I wish we had some insiders yeah. from, the, uh, from the administration. But uh, anyway, uh, l let's leave that to our uh, Augusta panel. And uh, Victor, I can see you uh, itching to get in there. Uh, to our colleague's point, yeah. is this more of a struggle for technological leadership globally as opposed to an ideological battle? No, I, I didn't say it, it is a rivalry of ideology. What I'm saying is I fear that the current trade tensions may evolve into a debate of ideology. And once you do that, there's no, no answer um, because, um, you know, different political system may manifest better or worse in a different uh, society, right? So I, w that will be uh, very difficult when you get into a debate on the ideology. But it, it could be very easy. That's, the, that's, the, that's the, the challenge. And we have to be careful that we try to um, have clarity uh, in the current debate it is supposed to be about trade, but actually it's about competitiveness as well. And, um, and who's going to um, prevail in the, in the future of the, the fourth or the fifth industrial revolution, right? Um, and that also has uh, uh, impact on the American supremacy in, in the technological world. So I think that's the that really is the, 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 the issue. Yeah. Uh, the gods of uh, conferencing have allowed us one more uh, question, although time is against us, and uh, let's take it from this lady in the, towards the front, please. Uh, we have a microphone winging its way, uh, winging its way to you. Quick last one. If you can make it really quick. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Miranda Johnson. I work for The Economist. And um, I just wondered, uh, how should the WTO respond to the American assault on its systems? And how severe is the damage that has been inflicted already? Yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> I think, Victor, go ahead. I, I think a lot of... Um, uh, uh, players are frustrated by the lack of um, progress uh, in, in, in the latest round. And it is very 
dangerous for people to come to a conclusion that the WTO process will never work and therefore we should scrap it. Because, as I said, despite its imperfection, it is the fairest and the most non-discriminatory system we have. Because smaller countries will have no chance to deal with bigger countries in a bilateral deal. But I think we have to decide how we can maintain that fair system and yet improve in the speed in which it can progress on the reform. And that really calls for political will. And Asia, uh, amongst us here, could take some you know, initiative to speed up that momentum. Victor, thank you. I'm going to give the absolute final word to uh, Alan, and then we're going to uh, bring these proceedings to a, to a close. What um, should we or should the WTO do? Should the Doha round's not going anywhere. Uh, it should be focused on plurilateral initiatives, so uh, particular sectoral advances that can work amongst particular groups of countries that are willing to meet and do that, information technology agreement, environmental goods arrangement, those sort of things. As for disputes, uh, it's a big, big problem, and I don't know how that gets solved. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, we're, we, I'm sure we can continue this discussion over uh, coffee outside in the foyer, but uh, let me just thank our uh, panel. It's been a very stimulating discussion. Ignatius uh, Darrell Le Kang, Alan Bollard, Yasuo Tanabe, and uh, Victor Chu. Thank you very much indeed, everybody.